All right. Welcome, everyone. This is the first inaugural uh, episode of Fatherhood Fables. This has been about a year coming for me. This idea came January of last year and took me a year to get everything going. But here I am, you know, fatherhood life is is busy. So I think a year is not not too shabby. But um, I'm super excited to start this thing out with one of my absolute favorites. We go back, I don't even know how many years now, but definitely a handful of projects. Yep. And um, at one point we were uh, working on two two films back to back and he'd al- always make the joke that we were seeing more of each other for that that time period than we saw of our wives. So uh, we've gotten to know each other really through some some of my, my hardest moments uh, a couple of years back and um, he was just a constant friend and someone I really look up to. And um, he's actually the founder, co-founder of BCA, which is Bethel Conservatory of the Arts. Um, which I know was a dream in his heart for many years. And it's been beautiful to see that thing happen uh, over the last couple of years and just flourish. And we're going to hear a little bit about that and what he's up to now and about his kids and stuff. So David Neronia, welcome to Fatherhood Fables. So excited to have you, man. Man, I'm so excited to be here and to hang out with you. Awesome, bro. So just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you're up to, how many kids you have, all that good stuff. <laughs> Well, yeah, man, we'll start with the kids. I joke that I'm almost Amish because I've got four kids and, you know, kind of like Abraham and Sarah, I've got a, I span from five-year-old all the way up to my three teenage boys, uh, eldest being 18, been married to my wife for going on 26 years this summer, man. Super proud of that. Um, she's still the hottest girl I know to me. And uh, yeah, man, on the creative side and and kind of on the business side, man, I I, uh, I co-founded BCA, the Bethel Conservatory of the Arts, and that's kind of been my labor of love. This is after serving as a producer at Bethel Media and directing films with you and Bethel Music. And that's really my history, man, is that I, I started off as an artist, as an actor when I was 17 years old. And um, yeah, I, I don't think I get through one day without thinking about story or artists or art, man. It's just kind of what makes me tick. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. I was when I was thinking about this uh, interview last night. I I was actually thinking about the few times I've heard you talk about story, mm-hmm. and just the impact that's had on me as a creative, as a storyteller. You know, we'll, we'll we'll hit a little bit more on some some fatherhood stuff, but I'd love for you just to kind of delve a little bit into like the impact of story, how that's impacted your life as you've kind of carved this thing out of, you know, story is central to who you are, both as a creative, Mm -hmm. I'm sure your story of where you came from, your dad, your family, um, all of that. So just maybe uh, that's not a very poignant question, but I love you just to kind of inside of the wrapper of story, like what what has that done for you? Yeah, man. And you know, it's funny, I'll start with this um, thing that every, every story has a title or usually every story has a title. And in, This connects with the theme of your podcast about fatherhood, because I asked the Lord a while ago, what is the title over my life? And it's actually an exercise that I do with my writers, and I encourage a lot of our artists to do it as well. It's like, if your life is a story, then it should have a title. And the title tells you what the story is about. a, A great title encapsulates, and it's almost, you can think of it as like the mustard seed of the story. In the title, you get a sense of what the theme the type of story, the tone, the focus, the objective of the hero and the protagonist, all of that could, should kind of be felt or, or uh, hinted at in the title. And the title over my life, when I asked the Lord that, he said to me, you are creative father, fathering creatives, a creative wow. father, fathering creatives. I'm a creative father because I happen to be a father. But there's different types of fathers. There's a protector father. There's a warrior father. There's a provider father. There's there's different kind of qualifiers or descriptors or adjectives that you can throw in front of father. And they're all valid and they're all beautiful. Yeah. And I think every father has a superpower or something that they're really great at, you know, that they just have this God-given gift. At. And mine happens to land in this particular thing. But it also describes for me then my own needs and my own wants. For me to live and breathe, I have to stay and be creative. But then it also describes what kind of father I'm going to be. So how that plays out for me is, you know, we read and we tell a lot of stories. Like, you know, one of the currencies in my home is stories, whether it's watching something with one of my sons or my daughters or talking about it or having read, you know, bedtime story in my house was like the holy of holies. And so I'm a creative father. But then the second half of the title over my life is Fathering Creatives. And that gives me my mission statement. It gives me my objective. Day to day here at BCA, 
I know that what I need to be is a father to creative. So not only am I described, but I get my mission statement just from the title. And that's just, we could talk on and on about story. If you look at the hero's journey, all I'll say about that is God did it first through the Mm -hmm. gospel. So when you actually study the hero's journey, there are points in it called the supreme ordeal. Well, that's him in Gethsemane, you know, sweating blood. The the resurrection is literally a step in the hero's journey. Like you can't wow. echo the gospel more clearly than actually what we've come to call the hero's journey, which is really Christ's journey. And yeah. N.T. Wright says that basically every story is an echo of the gospel. And so I could talk on and on about story. I think it's human currency. I actually think that outside of breathing, drinking water and eating, if we actually count the amount of hours that we take in and or create content, it is probably the thing that human beings do fourth most every single day of their lives. Wow, so fascinating. Yeah, it's true. That's, uh, yeah, when you start to think about like, I was just thinking social media to, you know, I mean, any of these, you know, obviously like I think in media terms, because, you know, it's just, you know, how, what I work in, but, um, you know, even hearing about my son's day when he comes home from school, right? It's like, it's He's all telling the story. Yeah. And so um, I think that's the beautiful power of being a, a storyteller, right? When you see yourself that way. So maybe just like walk us through quickly. I I love one of my favorite things is whenever we were, you know, taking a break in the the suite and I added suite and there'd be moments where you share like little stories about your life and be like, I never knew that. So maybe, <laughs> you know, obviously um, just doesn't have to be a lengthy thing, but just a little bit of like how you grew up and your relationship with your father and how yeah. that impacted who you are. So, yeah, man. I mean, I, I, it was babies making babies. My parents had me, my dad was 15 and my mom was 17 when I was born. Wow. So he was, he was a boy. He was a young man who, you know, got with a girl and, and, you know, <laughs> surprise, surprise along came me and, um, Did your dad like jump out a window or something. Did- Say again, man. Didn't your dad like jump out of a window or like when he, he did, got caught? Yeah. Well, yeah, at one point I think my uncle and my grandfather came home and caught them two both together. They were they were teenagers, not yet married, and uh but they fell in love and you know, I was a surprise and he was so young he literally couldn't get up to they he had to get like parental consent to come up to see me get born. <laughs> oh my god. That's how young he was. Wow. He did the best that he could. My parents, my parents are amazing, amazing people. We had some rough patches. My dad, you know, most of my childhood, there was addiction. There was pot and cocaine and LSD. It was the seventies going into the eighties. And so, but now he's like vegan and better shape than me and completely clean. He doesn't even drink. Um, you know, if, if, if parenting had like a high school yearbook, my dad would definitely win most improved. Um, We have a deep and beautiful connection now. My mom and I, she's moving to town. And so, but my, my childhood man was pretty, you know, and my parents and I, we've talked about this, like, we're all good. I've done the counseling thing. We've done the reconciliation and forgiveness thing. And, but I grew up, um, figuring out how to raise myself as well. Not because I wasn't fed and I I had parents around, but it was a little bit chaotic. They were just trying to figure themselves out. And so that was, I think, probably that that my childhood, as everybody's does, I think was probably the most formative thing. And I'm still walking out both the good, bad, and the ugly of that formation, because sometimes, you know, we form ourselves around the gnarls and, and the curves, and we then later on have to discover, hey, I think that maybe worked to survive when I was nine or 10, but maybe not great really for well. raising my kids. <laughs> um Totally. But yeah, man, I mean, that was my journey as a teenager growing up in the barrio. Uh, you know, we were working class, poor people. First time I ever got on a plane was to go to Carnegie to study and and to, to go to conservatory and to become an actor. And my my journey to fatherhood was, you know, uh, half of it happened at first without the Lord. And so I made a lot of mistakes and it was it was rough and it was tough. And I'm still figuring out parts of me that aren't always great and and trying to understand why that is what it is. But my wife and I, one of the things I am proud of, because we both came from divorce, is we just fought. We fought for our marriage, fought for healing and for growth. And um, yeah, dude, I mean, we're still standing strong on the same team. As I like to say, you know, we've decided to stand on the same team. And, um, you know, we're walking out the teenage years, which is a conversation in and of itself. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) I can't even imagine. I have my oldest is six. 
<laughs> and uh, sometimes the conversations we're starting to have, I'm like, oh my word, like just yeah. opinions. Like he's the sweetest, but <laughs> the opinions are, you know, just uh, becoming more firm. And uh, I'm, you oh, know, yeah. I can't imagine, you know, another six years, seven years when he's a teenager and just uh, all the things you learn along the way. And the, uh, <laughs> the I guess, um, you know, maybe just, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because obviously it gives me yeah. a perspective going into, you know, we're like, a, I'm a ways away, but uh, as fathers, I think sometimes I, I'll say this with, with Aiden, uh, I've realized, cause he is very much like me and I'm sure you probably have one of your, your kids. It's a little bit more like yeah. you than, than it's like parenting members, but... yourself. You're literally looking at yourself oh my going, goodness. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and it's such a challenge. Sometimes I'm like, it, it creates compassion for for towards towards him you know from me but at the same time i'm like oh you know i have to ask the question sometimes what 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 i have needed that i didn't get you know as as your kids have gotten older one's 18 maybe you know about to go to to college and you know he's a man like what what are some of the parenting and fathering things you've had to kind of recalibrate you know change um perspective you know for the for the better like what are some of those things you've learned in the recent years i mean the biggest thing i've had to confront is that apparently free will still exists and it exists in my home and in my children. It wasn't just in the garden. It wasn't just Adam and Eve. It was like, apparently uh, that is still there. And I, uh, frankly, um, we're in a whole reconfiguration right now because I've got literally a 14, a 16 and a soon to be 18 year old, all boys. And they're all taller and fitter than me. So, you know, there's that reality. I'm no longer the biggest, strongest man in the house and, you know, not just physical change, but, they are, they are self-determining now. And a lot of the tools of like, you know, even the love and logic and the Danny Silk stuff, it's like, that's served me greatly. It still informs how I, I try to, to, to parent, but I've, I've, I've hit the wall of the limitations of certain kinds of influence that I, I at least thought I had. One of the big things I want to say out loud is I believed the delusion that the teenage challenge was going to fly over my house like the Passover spirit. And I yeah. somehow wasn't going to have to actually deal with the gnarliness of teens. I really thought that. I really thought that because it hadn't yet happened. And then all of a sudden it landed in my house full force three times over. And I was like, oh, okay. So uh, it's been incredibly humbling, sometimes hard to go, oh, Okay, all those things I thought I had figured out, all, um, frankly, it's even been humbling of like, I thought I had been a better parent than maybe I am. <laughs> wow. um, you start to realize maybe some of the mistakes and, and things in you that have played out that now you've got three very strong in every sense of the word saying, hey, pointing out where you've missed the mark. And then in the midst of that, this is the most complicated thing is, is not only are they pointing out things in you, but you're talking to three human beings that are fully convinced that they're right. Yeah. Like teenage boys and maybe all teenagers are 100% convinced that they are right. And sometimes on a bad day that not only are they right, but you're an idiot. And so now you're confronted with, and then here's, here's a, a crazy stat, but the male, the male brain doesn't actually fully form. To the age of 25. That's wild, yeah. The age of 25. So now, and I say this lovingly and respectfully because my my three sons are amazing guys, very bright, very ambitious, you know, very driven each in their own uh, uh, ways. But I just say this from a physiological standpoint. I am literally talking to somebody that has a half finished brain who is convinced that they're 100% right. Yeah. Then in addition to that, I'm having to confront that I thought I was right about maybe more than I am. And now I'm being told by people who I love and I respect, but again, with everything else that I've just said, and I'm trying to figure out right now, I'm in the trenches of figuring out what's the truth, what is helpful, yeah. where do I need to change, where do I as a father need to continue to love, but to require. And that balance as a modern dad of bringing both the connection, the affection, all of the, the warms and the fuzzies and the, and the nice side. But then also like, where's the lion? Where's the firmness? Where's the alpha who says, that's not the culture of my home. And that equation, I'm walking through that right now. And it's probably one of the most complicated things emotionally and psychologically I've ever had to walk through. 
Wow, man. That's well, thanks for sharing. I, I think it's encouraging to hear because I think sometimes, I mean, I, I'm a nine on the Enneagram. So <laughs> I, you know, if you don't know the Enneagram, a nine is like, kind of like the peacekeeper, right? So I, I got to do what I, you know, I feel like I need to do sometimes. And as my, my oldest son is, is, you know, like I said, he's only six, but as he's developing these opinions and these things, I'm like, oh, I am no longer just at a level with him where yeah. I have to choose to engage. I mean, obviously he's not a man yet, but he's starting to ask questions about oh, like, yeah. how valid is my opinion? How, how strongly can I push up against you with, without you coming back at me? Like what, what kind of yeah. you know, level of discussion can we have? And, you know, these things, I, and I, I've just kind of, I've started to realize like, oh, I, I need to be okay with a bit of mess, you know? And even like his, his level of like coming back at me sometimes, obviously, you know, we, there's rules and there's ways that we engage sure. with mom and dad and especially mom, you know, I always say, Hey, that's my wife, you know, uh -huh. um, if, if he gets a little cheeky, but, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm allowing him to kind of have a little bit of that experimental space with me that kind of says, Hey, like, you know, I, I don't need you to get things perfect all the time. With you, with having three boys, I'm sure the energy sometimes is, you know, trying to, like I heard someone say once, trying to keep, or maybe it was you, keep the G.I. Joe out of their butt, you know, like, <laughs> like, well, like, please don't do that, you know? I'd love to hear a little bit too with your your fourth being a, uh, you know, daddy's girl. daughter, like your baby girl, like what's been the dynamic of, of that, of, okay, wow, I have my princess, I got three boys, you know, I'm working on being a dad and we're in teenage years, but also like, okay, now I have this part of me that's like, I think you told me the other day, you guys have watched The Mandalorian, uh, what, three times through yep. and like, you have this beautiful relationship with her that's probably in some ways contrasted, you know, yeah. what it is with your boys. Just maybe how, how, is, how you've navigated that? How, what, what does that look like for you? Yeah, man. I mean, you know, on the boy thing real quick, I, I, you know, when I, I always felt more comfortable around women because ultimately, you know, after my folks got uh, divorced, I was with my mom and my grandmother a lot. A lot of my mentors in life have been female teachers and stuff. And so it's like, I always had this like maternal and then lover relationship with women, you know, pre-Lord, you know, pre-Lord. It's like, I, I had a lot of girlfriends and then I had, so women were always a huge component of my life. It wasn't really, I didn't really start figuring out what masculinity look like with masculinity, like guy, guy, relationship, friendship, um, because it's just so radically different. And so I always felt more comfortable relating and talking to women. It was always easier for me to do that because it was what I was accustomed to. And then all of a sudden, God pulls this curveball on me and gives me three boys. I was always convinced I'd just get like three daughters or something like this. And I was like, oh, easy, great. I understand that. I thought I did, by the way. I thought I did. <laughs> uh, with, with three boys, what I've learned is this, is like, the first place they're going to wrestle is with, with, is with dad. And it starts off physical. Now, the irony is, is like, I, I, I never really had that relationship with my dad. It just wasn't who he was. And so I never really like, not that I can remember, play wrestled with my dad. And then all of a sudden, I've got these little creatures that are showing me love wow. through physicality. And so much in our society has kiboshed that and like kind of crushed it and said it's ADD or it's bad. And, you know, I'm not saying that there aren't some things that, you know, behaviorally that we need to, to look at with boys. But frankly, most of the world just isn't made for them. I mean, sitting around in school isn't made for them. Uh, yeah. um, you know, our homes have become these cool little Pier 1 import museums. And so it's like, where does a boy get to be a boy, climb trees, break things? Because that's part of just our nature is we're disruptors and builders and we have muscles and strength and it's just important. Like every single one of my boys was always, look at me, look at me, mommy, flexing. Now the three of them are at the gym and they're more ripped than I am. I mean, my eldest son comes <laughs> out of the bathroom. He looks like a freaking cobra. You know, his back's like, Hrawr. you know, they're all talking about calorie loading and creatine in my house. This is, my food bill is a mortgage right now. Um, <laughs> I'm not joking. And, uh, but the, the, on that thing of, of Aiden testing with you, what I've learned is it starts physically mm. and then it moves to verbal and to psychological. And this idea wow. of testing, there is a form of it that's rebellion and dishonoring. There, there is that uh, on the extreme, on the outer curve, it's that. But there's a part of it where they're trying to figure out how to be strong in a healthy way. And if they can't do that with dad, then they're going to do it with a girlfriend and, or they're going to do it with a boss or, or, or whatever. Yeah. And so for me, and I haven't really had this thought till talking to you, it's like watching the wrestling and the horse playing 
as a precursor to figuring out how to be a man and us having the sight to say, ah, I can mm-hmm. see what's happening here. It's not, you're not just against me. You're trying to figure out how to be a man, how to have tough conversations, ask yep. for what you need, self-determine. Um, and so that pushing back, you know, we as parents, it's like, it's hard not, you know, when you have the big red button on your chest and I get offended, but if we can have eyes to see that that's what's happening there, my daughter, short version of that, completely different. If my tone of voice even changes a little bit, I can see, and I'm talking like the mildest with my boys. Sometimes it takes me pounding my chest to be heard with my daughter. I whisper and she's like, Oh, okay, daddy. And I'm like, Oh, okay. I better, I better be aware that this is a different creature. Yep. That's, you know, you know, it's amazing once you get to know your kids too, like uh, my youngest is one. So, you know, mm-hmm. I'm just starting to see his personality, but yeah. the differences in the way that you parent, and not just gender, but you know, personalities mm-hmm. too. Cause the personalities, you got like three or four variables that you're, t- and there's never, there's never a manual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's evolving fluid. That's the, that's the most, it's like, you feel like you're showing up playing jazz every day and you're like, Oh, I thought I had it figured out. Oh, no, it doesn't work with you. Oh, no, it doesn't work this week. Oh, it worked yesterday. It doesn't, it's like, you know, when the kid is like, but I thought you liked PBJ. No, not anymore. You're like, Oh, okay. Okay. No, it's yeah. My son just told me that. Well, it used to be peanut butter and jelly every day. And all of a sudden it's like, no, 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 I don't, I, I've never liked that. I'm like, you've had this for the last two years of your life every day at school. He's like, I only like it with peanut butter and butter. And I'm like, okay. But uh, yeah, it's ever uh, ever evolving, just kind of discovery. Which I think I think that's one of the most beautiful things about fatherhood that I've, I've come to enjoy is the discovery. You know, I mean, the same yeah. can be said of of marriage. Oh yeah, man. In marriage, you have to pursue the discovery a little bit because sometimes life just yeah. happens, and you, you know, so you just kind of get through it. But with kids, obviously, there's like the the growing up years is. <laughs> You, they're just blossoming in front of you and they're, you know, discovering themselves and you're discovering who they are and opinions and thoughts and, you know, likes and the things that they're into. And in one of these upcoming episodes, I'll actually give a bit of a backstory to um, my journey and where Fatherhood Fables came from and um, what it is as kind of, mm. um, it was a bit of an exercise and like a journal journaling process for me when it first started. And wow. I realized um, when I lost my father in 2019 mm. that I, um, which again, you were in, you were literally, we were in, in the, the trenches 10 hours a day cutting bright ones um, in the middle of both libs being born and the whole year while my father was struggling with cancer. And um, yeah, that was deep, man. I think to say all of that, uh, you know, I... I discovered a part of of having both um, a father in my life. Honestly, you're you're the closest thing I've had outside of my father to a father that I've mm. um, just you know someone that you know you're not that much older than me, but I really respect and yeah. look up to. And we've had lots of just beautiful heart and hard conversations of of life. And um, yeah, but to to kind of you know go back to what I was of saying, where the fatherhood fables really was birthed out of. Mm the the process of learning to be fathered by God in two of the hardest seasons of my life. Wow. And um yeah, and I really appreciate you you being on the podcast. This is obviously not the last time I'm gonna have you on here. We'll have to have like uh every hundred episodes. <laughs> Here's David Neron is starting the the clock again. But um yeah man, I just I really appreciate you taking the time. I <laughs> respect who you are and I really just love you and um I'd love next time for maybe you to crack open a little bit more of the BCA thing because I think that one of the things that you have on your life is really, and it's unique, I've never seen it before, is really the ability to father creatives and have a voice um, with creatives who are discovering who they are. And, but also, um, I think as a whole, I sent you a voice note a couple of weeks ago, but I really think that you have such a God-given revelation into mm-hmm. fathering creatives and and creating a platform, I think, for the next generation and generations of what it looks like to partner with the Holy Spirit right. and and raise up creatives that are aware of who they are in Christ. Like I think we're just on the fringe of seeing the impact of what that looks Agreed. like. Um, and so, anyways, you know, we'll we'll get into that in a, in a further episode. But um, I just appreciate you being being on here, My bro, pleasure. for your voice and yeah. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Proud of you, brother.